Uh, it's a big pleasure for me uh, for this seminar, uh, which is uh, Jürgen Blinek, uh, who has uh, worked in the field of uh, experimental quantum optics, uh, atomic physics, and uh, uh, surface physics. Uh, he's uh, well known for having realized uh, uh, for the first time uh, an atom interferometer and for other uh, experiments in uh, atom uh, optics and quantum optics, uh, including the uh, Heisenberg uh, microscope and the measurement of the uh, uh, Wigner function of the quantum state of uh, matter and, uh, and light. In addition of his, of his uh, own, uh, own research, uh, Professor Mlinik uh, was the president of the uh, Helmholtz uh, Association of uh, German Research Centers, and uh, presently he is the uh, chair of the uh, Scientific Advisory Board of the European uh, uh, Quantum Flagship on, uh, on uh, Quantum Technologies. This is what he's going to tell uh, us about today. And I also mentioned that he is the uh, chairman of the uh, Board of Trustees of uh, the Falling Board Foundation that carries a number of, uh, of, <coughs> of conferences and, uh, and uh, demonstrations. Uh, last week there was a conference on the, on the dissemination of science at the, a very broad and global level. So it's an honor to have you here. The floor is here. Thank you, Maxi. Uh, Good morning. Everybody can hear me? Yeah. Wonderful. First of all, <coughs> congratulations that you can work in such a beautiful environment. Uh, I'm here with my wife always in this uh, week of November after the conference in Berlin, which takes place always on November 9, when the Berlin Wall came down. It's a conference on breakthroughs in science and uh, you know recently I thought what do I do if the sun is not shining <laughs> and I said let's call up Maxi <laughs> and uh, ask him whether I can come by and get some information on the beautiful physics that you are doing here so thank you very much Maxi for the invitation and for your hospitality now what I would like to do is to tell you a little bit about this uh, so-called second quantum revolution <coughs> and I try to be more general because there are also students, master students, PhD students around, non-experts, so let's uh, see how it works. Now you know quantum mechanics I wouldn't say is still a mystery but even uh, people like Einstein were not so comfortable with it uh, at the end. Uh, and uh, we had a talk by Chris Monroe on this uh, uh, November 9 event on quantum computing. And he said when you want to understand quantum computing, you have to understand quantum mechanics and quantum science. And there are only two rules that you have to somehow have in mind. One is in the microscopic domain, think in terms of waves. You know, as we know, Schrodinger equation, particles are waves. So they are not very well located. But in addition to this wave picture where you can have interference and things like that, you have to have an observer because with the observation, things become real. So one question that Einstein was asking is, does the moon also exist where no one is looking at it? We have full moon now, and yesterday evening, for example, it was just beautiful looking at the sky and so forth. So the role of the observer is important in quantum me mechanics as well as other issues that I come back to in a moment. <coughs> It's always a little bit funny to speak about, you know, the second quantum revolution because people say, come on, I mean, quantum physics is known for over 100 years and you find uh, in consumer goods, you find products that are based on quantum science. So, so what's the big deal about it? 
As a matter of fact, revolutionary ideas turned into breakthrough technologies like the laser, uh, nuclear magnetic uh, resonance, um, imaging, out of these first experiments by Pound and Purcell on uh, NMR and solids, a whole branch developed of technologies to make uh, images based on uh, nuclear um, spin resonance. You have the transistor, you have GPS, optical fibers. GPS, again, is for me a nice example of uh, things where you would never have imagined that this can become reality and an everyday good. You know, I'm, I'm, an, I'm a fan of these James Bond movies. And my favorite movie is Goldfinger. Maybe, maybe, maybe that's a question of age. Maybe the younger generation doesn't know. Goldfinger, if you have a chance to see it, is really great. It was, you know, made in the mid-60s, shortly after the invention of the laser. But in one situation, James Bond was driving this Aston Martin in the Alps. And he had a screen in the car where he exactly saw where he was. You know, of course, there was someone following him, and then there was a shooting and so But there was the screen in the Aston Martin in the mid-60s, and he saw where he was. And everybody thought, come on, I mean, this will never happen. <laughs> never. And now everybody has it in his or her car. I'm saying this because sometimes you need to have some fantasy also as a scientist to see where things can develop to. Now, coming back to uh, semiconductors and, and transistors and so forth, um, also in terms of what can we expect from the next generation also of uh, semiconductor devices, including computers, um, there, there are some sayings that are true and are not true. I come back to one uh, that is a, a fake one at the end of my talk. But from Richard Feynman, we know this saying, there's plenty of room at the bottom. He, at the end, was someone who really started nanoscience and nanotechnology. And you see, if, if, if you go on with the, oh, you have a green one, that's <laughs> very good, because normally, you know, the they use the red ones and you hardly see them and I always say take the green one. Not yet the blue one. Okay, yeah. <laughs> we won't do that. <laughs> okay, there, there, there is an end. There is an end here because even with the present um, technologies you, you can go down let's say to maybe a few nanometers and that's it. And then we are close to the size of a single atom. I don't know how much you know about the present status of uh, lithography to create these structures. The most recent trend is called EUV, extreme ultraviolet lithography. It's not called X-ray lithography because X-ray lithography makes fear. <laughs> Therefore, <laughs> you know, X-ray, extreme UV lithography, it's 30 nanometers. And by now, systems are sought, and the mark leader that's also interesting to know is ASML. It's a Dutch company. This was originally Philips, together with SAIS in Germany. SAIS produces the optics. It's not uh, transmission optics, it's reflection optics. And ASML, the whole machine around it, and, and such a system, by the way, costs roughly 100 million euros one machine, it's the size of a building to produce these small structures. And, and there, there is a natural end of this. And there are people saying that the future of computing is not, if you think in terms of high performance computing, become smaller and smaller, but maybe at the end have a hybrid system of HPC, high performance computing, the way we know it, neuromorphic computing, which is based on a different approach and quantum computing. But we can discuss this later on. Anyhow, <coughs> what's new about this, this second quantum revolution? And I always show this picture with the Dalai Lama. 
I don't show it when I'm in China. <laughs> but I think Mallorca is safe. <laughs> I will survive this talk showing the Dalai Lama. <coughs> okay. Now, why do I show the Dalai Lama? A couple of years ago, the Dalai Lama was visiting Innsbruck. And in Innsbruck in Austria, there are some colleagues. One is still there, Rainer Blatt, working on iron traps. But another one is now in Wien, Anton Zeilinger, who was also thinking about, let's say, the philosophy of quantum information science and so forth. So the Dalai Lama wanted to talk to him, but he also wanted to go into the lab of Rainer Blatt, who was able, so it's a while ago, to trap one iron, you know, in, in a trap. And, and the Dalai Lama was fascinated by the fact that you can trap a singer quantum entity and even see the light emitted from the single iron and what he wanted to really experience is that these photons, this light from the single iron impinges on his own retina you know, the Dalai Lama okay, anyhow um, and I'm saying this because the second quantum revolution really has to do with the creation, the manipulation, and the detection of single, isolated quantum entities. That's really new. Using the superposition principle, entanglement, and so forth, that's different from a transistor where you look at quantum phenomena in a bulk system, many body system, and so forth. Okay. That's such a picture of a single iron in a trap. And maybe you can see the single iron fluorescing here. Again, I mean, not spectacular. It was spectacular 20 years ago. But what is spectacular about this picture is it was taken with a mobile phone. Would you have imagined 20 years ago, not only that you, you know, are like a cyborg, who can now nowadays live without uh, an iPhone or something like that. But would you have imagined 20 years ago that you can do this type of you know, image taking with a mobile phone that everybody has in his or her pocket? Again, something <coughs> unbelievable 20 years ago, now reality. Good. There is a lot of hype in this uh, topic of second quantum revolution and quantum uh, technologies. And uh, this, this is a so-called Gardner hype cycle for emerging technologies. Uh, there is the innovation trigger. Then there is the peak of inflated expectations. Then there is the draw of these illusionment. You know, depression, everybody is uh, down the slope of enlightenment, and then the plateau of productivity. Mm -hmm. I don't know in which discipline you are working, <laughs> but maybe you can locate yourself with your scientific work on one point on this curve. I would say quantum computing, where is quantum computing? Quantum computing is here on this uh, rising, rising slope. This is from 2018. Probably it's now up here and uh, we see what, what happens. So there's a lot of hype. And, and of course here, uh, how can I say, the danger is that some people, maybe the community as a whole, oversells what is possible. You, I, I say you always have to be ambitious, but you also have to be realistic. So let's see what comes out of quantum computing. At least there is a, there is in quantum technologies there is a hype at the moment, but uh, you know uh, maybe a quantum winter follows and then we have spring and summer again. Normal, I would say just normal for emerging technologies. Quantum technologies worldwide. Uh, again, you see immediately there are three. Uh, let's say countries that 
or, or regions that are important. There, there is America with the United States. There is China uh, with the Asian region. And then, of course, there is Europe. And uh, within Europe, I mean, the, norm, the, the usual suspects are going strong because they have a strong support for, for science. Like, for example, Germany is also the largest country. Spain. Uh, is uh, doing well, okay, I would say. Uh, could be better. <laughs> There's always room of improvement. But that's the situation. That's the situation. Combined estimated budget of EU countries. But you clearly see the, EU, the European Union, Europe is a strong player in this game. That's the message here. Uh, a couple of years ago, over 3,500 scientists, research institutions, and companies endorsed something called the Quantum Manifesto. And the idea here was to convince the European Commission in Brussels to start some major initiatives in this area of quantum technologies. And again, making a more general remark, the question always is, are there some, you know, bigger issues coming up for the society, uh, for, for science and technology in the future that really should be um, approached with such a large scale initiative? Some people call it moonshots or whatever. Do we need this, yes or no? There is always a debate going on saying we don't need this, just put more money into basic research and something will come out of it and revolu revolutionize the world. But my conviction is that for some topics you really need combined uh, efforts, uh, uh, cooperation also across national boundaries to really advance a topic. So this was uh, the start and then this vision of the quantum flagship came up, uh, consolidate and expand global scientific leadership, as you have seen, and basic research as a whole. Europe is doing fine, also compared to the US and China. Kickstart a competitive European quantum industry and make Europe attractive for innovation and investment. Now this, for the flagship, I'll say a few more words about it. It's really essential. Kickstart a competitive European quantum industry. Now, what's the idea behind it? The idea behind it is that in the semiconductor industry, ship production and so, Europe somehow lost at the global level. Does it make sense to start an Airbus-type project on semiconductor fabrication? I doubt it maybe for a special area where you need really very secure chips for certain applications, yes. But in general, I would say probably this war is lost to essentially Asia. It's mainly Asia, US, Intel, Samsung, and the Taiwanese company. So there are three or, three or four, there are only three or four, let's say, big companies that produce the type of ships that I showed you in this Moore presentation. But here the idea is, if this is really new, also a new technology, maybe Europe has a chance to not only become leader scientifically, but also start a new industry. This was the idea behind it. And that's why from the very beginning, and we discussed this uh, before, Roberta, David, and, and Maxi, and therefore from the very beginning, the idea here in this flagship was to involve the private sector companies right away. This flagship is not on basic science. It's on project where from the very beginning you have contacts and corporations with companies because the idea is really to come up with new technologies that at the end create new jobs and help us keep our standard of living also in Europe. So the quantum flagship was decided three years ago. Um, 
It's a 1 billion euro business over 10 years, but again, very important, only 500 million euros comes from Brussels and the other 500 million have to come from the member states. Now, what does this mean? I can tell you what it means for Germany. For Germany, it means Germany normally pays 20% of the overall EU budget. 500 million, 20% is 100 million over 10 years. Germany will do much more. I think they should do even more than they have decided, but they will do more than just 10 million per year over 10 years. This would be the German contribution to the flagship. Nobody can force the national states, the member states, to be part of it. I mean, you know, it's, it's a general type of agreement. I don't know the percentage of Spain with respect to the overall EU budget should be at the 10% level. I think yeah, it was by yeah. the, pop <coughs> the population, you are 50 million, right? 500 million, maybe 10%, something like that, maybe a little bit less. Let's say 10%. So it would be, what, 50, uh, 500 million, 10%, five, would be 5 million or so per year over 10 years support for this lecture via the National Science Foundation that you have or something like that. So I don't know how your program look, looks like at the moment, but if it, if it works the way it is supposed to work, that should be the minimum that also a country like Spain invests. So there is a ramp up phase three years and then 21, the full implementation for the next seven years will start. And when I was sharing the High Level Steering Committee to make a recommendation for the strategic research agenda, we came up with this simple uh, graph. It shows that we have <coughs> essentially four pillars. One is sensing and metrology. That's probably closest also to products. A company like Bosch, for example, that produces sensors, acceleration sensors and so forth of all kinds, sensors of all kinds, is interested in, in the say, uh, quantum sensors. Then you have uh, simulation and computation. For me, simulation is the analog version of quantum computation in a certain sense. So there was a debate whether we should separate quantum simulation from quantum computation. At the end, we said we do it. And then there is quantum communication. And there is an underlying, let's say, bar basic science. And here, basic science projects are included that can be not, that cannot be part of one of, let's say, this vertical pillars. So the idea is whenever you are doing basic research and can be part of communication, computation, and sensing. Put it here together with consortia that include the private sector. If you have a crazy idea of, let's say, a completely new type of qubit or of a communication scheme, then put it into basic science. But the least money is in basic science because, as I emphasized, the quantum flagship is towards technologies. So in the ramp up phase, the overall budget from Brussels is 130 million. 20 million is here and 110 million is distributed over the pillar. So from the very beginning, it was clear that the rejection rate would be highest for basic, basic science. So no, no surprise in that sense. We updated the strategic research agenda recently and tried to formulate some short, mid and long term targets. So what does it mean in, let's say, quantum computing? What do we want to achieve in three years, six years, 10 years from now? Um, what about platforms and thematic areas? Do we need some kind of major platforms, for example, in quantum computing? If you take ions and traps or superconducting devices, do we need some platforms where people can also go and 
use the technologies, the technology platforms as some user facilities. Because you know, if you set up, for example, supercomputing uh, qubits in these uh, fridges with all the technology around it, it's a major investment and it's not only the one-time investment, but it's also the running budget that has to uh, be taken care of. So the question at the moment is, do we need platforms at the European level for communication, for computation, and then of course, as always, the question is, how can we measure success? What are key performance indicators in this area that make sense? Where you measure, do you achieve your goals, your milestones, yes or no? So in that sense, it's, it's, it's a very, yeah, it's a technology problem. Now, just to give you an idea about the, the, the different schemes that are discussed, is there valid? I exist, Juncker exists, and Merkel is also there. Still, we don't know in Germany uh, whether she will make it at the end of, of her term, another two years, or Juncker hopefully will uh, start, uh, end his term in the next couple of weeks with a new commission, which, by the way, is also. Um, debated with respect to research. Maybe you have heard that there will be a DG, there will be no more a DG research. The new directorate is called Innovation and Use. Difficult, I mean, I think you find it difficult, we find it difficult, the whole scientific community finds it difficult that research is completely eliminated in the title of, of uh, the EU directorates. Anyhow, now quantum communication, as I said, relies on the, the uh, production, manipulation, and detection of single quantum entities. And one simple means to explain quantum communication is to say you have a flow of single quantum entities, photons, and if you transform information from one point to the other, you want to make it in a secure way. And in contrast to you know normal communications with many photons, a light level with noise in it, an eavesdropper can attract information without really being somehow observed. Because, I mean, it's, it's really difficult. If, if if you have a com classical communication line from A to B and, and an intensity level with some noise and you pick up some of the photons to get the information, it's, it's hardly, <coughs> it's hardly uh, detectable. Here the idea is, okay, if there are photons missing because if an eavesdropper tries to get the information, he has to get some, in, some photons out of the stream of photons, you will see it. I mean, that, that's the very simple approach. Of course, you can also work with more complicated setups using entanglement, uh, uh, quantum teleportation, and so forth. Um, but but that's, that's the underlying idea. And, and again, if you do this, it becomes obvious from the very beginning, you need single photon sources. You, you need extremely low loss transmission lines. You need single photon detectors. You need new schemes for amplifiers. There is a no cloning theorem in the quantum world. It's not like, you know, in the classical optical data uh, um, highways where you have erbium dope fibers or something like that to amplify the signal after 100 kilometers or so. It doesn't work here. You have to come up with completely different schemes. One key word is uh, uh, quantum repeaters. Uh, you need uh, key distributions, quantum key distributions. So there, there is a lot of physics and also technologies behind this. <coughs> Another question is, how do you communicate? Do you do it through optical fibers, ground-based, or can you also go through space? 
And this is one example, again, uh, two years old, as you see here, by a uh, Chinese colleague, Jan Wei Pan. Uh, he convinced the Xi Jinping, the president, he has a direct relationship to the Chinese president, to set up a satellite mission. And, you know, a satellite mission costs roughly 100 million euros. You need the rocket and everything, the satellite to set up a quantum communication scheme in the satellite and transmit information via space from A to B. Now again, the photon count rate here is of the order of one per second. So, I mean, it's like this James Bond thing, you know? But who knows, in 10 or 20 years, if you really tweak all the technologies, it can be better. But this shows in principle the possibility to also go into space and communicate from point A to point B through free space with quantum uh, setups. Quantum computing. Bill Phillips, a Nobel laureate, uh, he got the Nobel Prize for uh, laser cooling of atoms. Uh, said a few years ago, quantum information is a radical departure in information technology more fundamentally different from current technology than the digital computers from the other cost. And what does he mean? I think quantum computing is really difficult to explain because it, it, it again is related to quantum superposition states, entanglement and so forth. But I think at the end the main difference is that instead of processing information in a serious way, you can do it in a complete parallel way. And with even 300 qubits, uh, you can have, let's say, a parallelism of the order of, because this number is so, it's exponential, is so large that it, uh, over exceeds the number of atoms that you have in the universe. Always provided that the 300 qubits work perfectly, which is not the case. I mean, you know, there, there is decoherence and you have to make quantum error correction. But again, it's, it's, it's really parallel processing from the very beginning due to this entanglement between uh, the quantum entities. And for me, this is a very nice example. A quantum computer crunches all possible combination at once. At what scale ever? And I come back to, to that in a moment. And there are different realizations at the moment. I would say the three, me, the three leading um, hardware systems are eins in a trap. Maybe you have seen these pictures of ions lined up in a, in a linear trap, for example. At the moment, you can go to some 10 ions, maybe you can go up to 100, maybe a couple of hundred, but that's it. Uh, the other system are superconducting qubits based on Josephson junction type schemes. Low temperature, again, you can go up to I mean, 50, 100, maybe a few hundred, but going above 100, 1,000, or even more is not obvious. And the third one are semiconductors, but they are not there where the ions and the, the superconducting schemes <coughs> are right now. And you can play games with these type of systems. Uh, Google and, and also IBM have some kind of open queue computing the schemes where you can also uh, try out things yourself. Quantum simulation, I don't want to go into details here, are analog versions of quantum computing. Imagine, let's say, an, an optical, a dry, three dimensional optical lattice filled with atoms, called atoms. You can address, let's say, single sides in this three dimensional. Um, scheme and then play games with it and there is a coupling of, of one of these atoms to the to the other atoms in in this in this lattice and you can do it via spins you can do it via, via other types of interaction <coughs> what about quantum sensing and metrology 
This is an example of measuring uh, small g, the Earth's uh, acceleration. Um, you can do this optically. I don't know whether you know how exploration takes place. It's, it's a device called a falling corner cube. It's an optical interferometer where you have one arm fixed and the other arm is a cat eye, an optical reflector that then falls towards the Earth. You count fringes and you can really measure the local Earth acceleration to a precision up to delta g over small g, 10 to the minus 9 or so. And depending on the value of g, you know how the explore, uh, how, what, is, what is under the ground. And if you want to become more sensitive, atom interferometry is a way because the, in, the op, in the atom interferometer, you have the interfer interference of the particle waves. And the sensitivity scales like rest mass of the particle over photon mass, which is a large factor, so you gain orders of magnitude. However, what you lose is you are losing uh, with an atom interferometer compared to an optical interferometer with respect to the enclosed area. So the sensitivity atom interferometer versus light interferometer scales like uh, rest mass of the particle, which for an atom is much larger than just a few e watts, like the photon, and enclosed area. But at the end, with an atom interferometer, you still gain two to three orders of magnitude. That's why there are startups right now that really construct and sell atom interferometers also to exploration companies like Shell also uh, for that purpose. Another example, and I like this very much, is this laser interferometer for, gravita for gravitational wave detection. Uh, as you remember, in September 2015, the first uh, gravitational wave detection was done with the LIGO uh, interferometers in the US. And um, what I didn't know was the following. There was a first experiment on the ether theory by Michelson in the late uh, decades of the 19th century, by the way, in Potsdam near Berlin. And since then, the sensitivity of optical interferometers uh, gained a factor of 10 each decade. So since 120 years, <laughs> the sensitivity of optical interferometers went up by a factor of 10 power 12. And people in the field say it will continue. And it continues at the moment because in the interferometer, they are using now squeeze states of light. You know, I was working myself on the production of squeeze states of light in the mid-90s using optical parametric oscillators. And when you write publications and it's still the same, there's always the last paragraph. And in the last paragraph, you write about the bright future of what you are doing. You know? <laughs> and in my last paragraph, there was always a sentence, you know, one day in the future, these squeezed lights will be used in optical interferometers, especially for gravitational wave detection. <laughs> Did I believe it? <laughs> but again, you see, this is an example that 20 years, 25 years later, things that seem impossible can become reality because technology really advances, advances, advances. So now they have nearly one event of some kind of cosmic catastrophe, I think a week, two or three a week, and in, in the next six to 12 months, 
it will observe a gravitational wave one per day. And still 10 years ago, they were happy to observe one gravitational wave, if any, during a PhD thesis. <laughs> and of course, now we can debate how long does a PhD thesis last. <laughs> I don't know here, but let's say three years is not unreasonable. So from three years to one day, wait, isn't that great? So that's a new window to look into our universe also based at the end on quantum phenomena and, 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 and new technologies, including quantum technologies. Because also the lasers advanced and the mirrors, you, you have to imagine this unbelievable sensitivity. It's detecting the distance Earth's moon on the, the, on the diameter of an atom nucleus of a proton. And, and I mean, this uh, mirrors free hanging and so forth. And at one moment, because you also have a high power in, in, this, um, in this interferometer, it's three kilometers long and the light is running back and forth, you have light pressure on the mirrors. And the question is, what does this do to the mirrors? Can you maybe play quantum optomechanical games to even become below the standard quantum noise limit in these type of mechanical setups. So a lot of, again, interesting basic questions related to all this. Okay. I think I have to come to an end. Um, well, this is this uh, merge of the two black holes, the first observation in, in September 20, um, 2015. Now this is, uh, <coughs> I, I, ha I have some favorite philosophers. One is Marilyn Monroe. <laughs> Again, maybe that's a question of age, but Marilyn Monroe has, has said wonderful sentences. One is, for example, I have been on many calendars, but never on time. <laughs> and another one is, she said, I'm not interested in money, I just want to be wonderful. If you see this as a scientist asking for funding, funding, be careful, this can backfire. Yeah? <laughs> but, okay, there is this movie where she says, uh, some like a tot, I think, is, is the title of the movie, Diamonds are a girl's best friend. And this is a fake, uh, um, a fake uh, saying of Einstein, diamonds are quantum physicists' be best friend. These are uh, this nitrogen, nitrogen vacancy centers in diamonds, which have turned out to be <coughs> very, very good quantum sensors. Again, at the single particle level, they even work at room temperature. They use the manipulation of, of atomic spins through optical interaction. This is an uh, uh, application, again, of magnetic field sensors. This is uh, the product of a startup company in Boulder. They are using vapor cells where they optically pump atoms and detect magnetic fields so sensitively that they can um, uh, detect uh, currents in, in, the, in the human brain, you know, like, like the encephalography that you have so far mainly with superconducting devices. If, if you see this scheme compared to the normal one where, where you have a hood, a huge one where you need cryogenics and Josephson junctions and so forth to measure very sensitively magnetic fields from the brain, that's a clear progress. Whether this will become a product or not, but again, it uses quantum <coughs> technology, it's a completely different approach. Meanwhile, in the lab, how is your quantum computer prototype coming along? Great, the project exists in a simultaneous state of being both totally successful and not even started. Can I observe it? That's a tricky question. We, we, are, we are back to this moon picture from the very beginning. Maybe you have heard about this Google claim 
to have demonstrated quantum supremacy. They came up with a 53 superconducting qubit device and showed that in a, for applications completely irrelevant problem, they were faster, much faster than using a high performance computer. I mean, the fastest computers available now. They solved the problem within, I, I think, minutes or so, where otherwise you would have uh, uh, needed 10,000 years. Of course, that was debated. The IBM guys, that's a competitor of Google, said we can do it in three days, but still a minute and three days still makes a big difference. So is this now the breakthrough in quantum computing where you have showed that a certain class of problems can be addressed really better with these quantum devices, yes or no, uh, we will see. International cooperation and competition. For Europe, there are two main competitors. One is the US. <coughs> it's the public sector, but it's also these internet companies. They are sitting on huge piles of cash, and whether Google or Microsoft or Facebook or Apple burn 100 million or 500 million dollars from one day to the other, nobody cares. They just do it. And they are going for it. Then you have, you have China. China has unlimited resources. Unlimited, somewhere they have a money printing machine. I don't know where, but somewhere in China there is a money printing machine. So unlimited resources, and I tell you, I was in, in Shenzhen in May, sh shortly after uh, Trump put Huawei on the blacklist. I had the chance to talk to the founder of Huawei, Mr. Ren, someone who had really started the company in the early in the late 80s, early 90s, like Steve Jobs started Apple. Very impressive person. And my feeling was that after what happens with Trump to China, the Chinese are really, what can I say, more than addicted to becoming the leaders in all leading technologies full stop. They will do everything. That what does Trump to them at the moment never happens again. So they will power resources and you know everything into all kinds of leading technologies, AI, robotics, machine learning, quantum technologies, to become the world wide number one. And they have a strategy, it's an autocratic system. When we are the political committee and decide tomorrow, let's go, we start tomorrow. So I'm, I'm saying this to make clear how, how the situation in Europe is. You know, we have a lot of advantages compared to an autocratic system. We don't have these uh, monopolist companies like in the US, but we have to get our act together Otherwise, we'll have a problem with respect to the US and China, which are our main competitors. <coughs> These are companies being involved in the business. And again, as I said, in the US and China, there are also private companies um, working on quantum technologies. Not so much in Europe, not so much in Germany. I was talking to someone from the executive board of Siemens, for example, uh, three years ago to get him interested in quantum technology and the answer was, listen, we as Siemens are a technology taker, we are not a technology maker. Mm -hmm. If you have something that we can, you know, build into our systems, fine, please come again. But at the moment, a company like Siemens is not willing to invest any large amount of money into quantum technology. And the same is true for quite some big companies. That's why startups are very important in Europe. We need young people like the one sitting in the back. If you have a good idea, start your own company, become rich, drive a Ferrari or Porsche, <laughs> and enjoy life on Mallorca. But I mean, you, you know, do it. Okay, I think that that's, that's it essentially. 
Quantum Internet, thank you for your attention. Sure. So, any uh, questions or comments from anyone? Yes. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, you mentioned that uh, the quantum flagship is aimed at uh, bringing quantum technology to the industry, but uh, uh, in the field of uh, quantum communication, quantum computation, uh, or also quantum simulation, uh, if I am in an industry, I'm thinking, what is something that I can create with these technologies that is really useful for society? and not for the lab. I don't know about quantum sensing, it's not, not my area, but uh, in mm -hmm. these areas, uh, what is uh, that uh, any industry should create to sell it in the market? Mm -hmm. I think sensing is somehow understandable. You, you, you need in, in, in sensing, what you are interested in is increased sensitivity. In communication is increased security. But uh, we do not need it. Uh, well, you know, if you, in, in computing, computing is the real shift in paradigm. That's not comparable to what you have done before. In computing. In, yeah. in computing. So, so that's why, let's say, uh, companies like those companies who are in the computing business or need computers really don't want to miss the train. It's, 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 as I tried to explain at, at the meter level, there the, the approach is really completely different. Now, if you have sensors that are more sensitive, there are always business options. Yeah, yeah, yeah of course. Uh, in communication, of course there are, let's say, the military complexes, the bank sector, <coughs> where interest is clearly there to transmit information at the highest security level from A to B. But still, RSA, if someone uses RSA protocol, uh, it's sort of, a, okay, not mathematically, but a sort of a practically completely central by now. Well, as I said, I brought a few examples where, you know, when you look back and would have thought, would this have been any market 10 or 20 years later, you would have probably said no. Yeah. Companies are not, the, 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 the main uh, uh, investment of the U.S. companies in the U.S. is computing. Yeah, but also in computing, like uh, uh, quantum computation is universal, but quantum supremacy is not. There are some protocols, uh, some uh, algorithms that are faster in a quantum computer. And actually, I, I mean, I'm not talking about the universal quantum computer. Maybe it's only of interest to certain problems. Yeah. Communication in the US, quantum communication is not such an issue because if I talk to colleagues there, they're saying, that the conventional uh, approach in, in cryptography and so forth is so advanced they can't believe that this plays a role. On the other hand, the Chinese are heavily investing in quantum communication because they want to make sure that nobody can somehow, you know, hack their systems. And again, looking back, also in the way how funding agencies work. If you look to the US, <laughs> you have this DARPA and, and other agencies that from the very beginning have invested heavily also because of this military complex in two new technologies, the semiconductor technology, uh, lasers, optical fibers, the internet and so forth because there was an interest to really get this off the road. And then, I mean, we use it now daily. We can't imagine a world without it. So it's really difficult to say what kind of business will develop out of it. But the real paradigm shift is computing. 
there might be more questions that we can send. <laughs> you can want to flagship uh, stuff with this. Mm -hmm. And so maybe it's one of the most important tools that we have to compete against the US. Mm -hmm. so how is it doing? <laughs> I, I think, I mean, I was not involved in this evaluation process and so forth. This was done by Brussels. They, they, they selected the reviewers and so forth. And of course, this was difficult because the best people within Europe, they were somehow, you know, in one of the consortia, so there was a conflict of interest. So they were looking for reviewers from the outside was a real challenge because if Europe does something, do you want to have Chinese or Americans to tell you what is good or not? So, so it was a challenge. We solved the problem. I think the outcome of the consortia is, is, is fine. The, the main topics are covered. And I can only say the flagship runs smoothly and in a very cooperative way. I, 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 I would love to see, let's see, this uh, uh, level of cooperation, for example, within Germany. Within Germany at the moment, we have a lot of different activities, Max Planck, Helmholtz, Fraunhofer, the university, the DFG. It's not very well coordinated. I have a good feeling with respect to the European activity. But we need a stronger involvement of the private sector. That's, <coughs> for me, that's the main, the main challenge. Yeah, we're facing one, the first question. Can you guess what will be the first product from this second uh, quantum revolution that we will buy in the supermarket? Well, I'm, I'm not sure whether this will be B2C from business to consumers. It can be also B2B that a company like Bosch develops accelerators, for example, or uh, electric field uh, 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 sensors or magnetic field sensors that are then used in the car industry or, or in the uh, aircraft industry and so forth. What the Bosch people tell me is that for them it's not unrealistic to have a quantum sensor business in the next five to ten years of roughly 100 million euros a year. Which is a start. Do you? For mm example, -hmm. do you believe that this, the many sensors we have in our mobile phones will be replaced by a single atom or single photon sensors? So, it, again, it depends on how technology evolves. You don't want to have a fridge in your hand, of course. <laughs> but if you, if you can use systems that work at room temperature reliably, why not? One last question. Um, it's not directly related to, to the quantum flag question. When you said this uh, LIGO can measure the distance from the Earth to the by uh, the dimension, was it just a comparison or were you talking, were you talking real? No, that's real. <laughs> but then because how do you define the distance between the Earth and the Moon by a precision of one atom diameter? Because even the, uh, the center of mass shifts so much just when mm. someone moves on the surface. No, no, what I said is the delta L over L that the interferometers can detect by now is, is even better. It's 10 to the minus 22. Yeah, so, okay, so it was a comparison. Yeah, yeah, sure. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> Because nobody can imagine normally what 10, I mean, you can, but 10, 10, these exponentials are different to explain, so I always try to give mm -hmm. any examples. Okay, if there is no any other urgent question, I think we can uh, thank again Professor Bruno. I hope it was the right mixture.